Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, this is a live stream looking at magical horns in A Song of Ice and Fire. We have two probably extremely important magical horns going on in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, Dragonbinder and the Horn of Winter. So uh, we're going to be focusing in on them. Uh, and uh, as always, I'm going to frame this around questions that I get from my patrons. I've got a whole load of questions. And I have covered this issue probably about a year or so ago, um, but I didn't get a chance to answer all of the questions that are out there. So I thought I'd just come back to it just as a sort of, sort of a one-off and uh, try and answer as much as I possibly can. Before we uh, get going, I just wanted to say quick thank yous to uh, Tut Sprachen Leben Lenger. Apologies for um, not pronouncing that correctly, I suspect. Saying, sadly, I can't stay due to work, but will watch on the morrow while virtually driving, probably through Europe this time. Have a token of appreciation. Thank you so much. I recommend Switzerland, if you have the choice, if you're virtually driving somewhere around Lake Como, perhaps, North Italy. Uh, Mara Lee, thank you so much for the super sticker. I hugely appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, and also to Ravens, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Devyani Jackson, thank you, uh, just now saying that your content and wise, witty words are a balm in these crazy times. We appreciate you to the moon and back. Oh, thank you. I uh, I very much appreciate that. That's very kind. Uh, two Ravens just saying thank you for all that you do. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look uh, firstly at Dragonbinder, then we'll look at the Horn of Winter, then we'll try and look at the both of them together and sort of try and uh, see thematically what's going on there. Um, so let's start with uh, Dragonbinder. Uh, of course, I will try and pick up as many questions from the chat as we are going through, but I'll uh, start off with a question from uh, Eric Fogg saying, how and where do you think the Warlocks found Dragonbinder? Which is a, a good sort of intro to making sure we're all on the same page of what is Dragonbinder, where did it come from, what might it do, where is it now? So Dragonbinder first appears, and Dragonbinder as a word we only get once in the entirety of A Song of Ice and Fire. It's often called the Hellhorn and things like that. It first makes an appearance um, at the Kingsmoot over on the Iron Islands, and there's a bit of a dispute happening between Victarian supporters uh, and the supporters of Asha, Yara, uh, and they're just sort of bickering away, and then suddenly there's this huge sound which resounds all over, uh, and people look to see what's going on, and this somebody is blowing this huge black this banded magical horn, um, which they all call the hell horn. It sends everyone shivering, feeling hot, burning inside. Um, this sound which resounds all around, and that calls everything to silence. And that is what heralds Euron joining the king's moot and from that moment on he has grabbed everyone's attention he says this horn this can uh, take a dragon and bind it to my will and with that we will conquer all of westeros not just like a few little raids down the coast and all the rest of it and Asha obviously says, yeah, there are no dragons. He says, I know that there are now, there are three dragons uh, and I will get them. So he basically ups the ante over everything that everyone else has been saying and he wins the day. He gets made king. Then he gives this hellhorn to Victarion, who, uh, as... Um, George R. R. Martin says, is thick as a stump. Uh, and so basically Euron is using him, but he gives him the hell horn and says, go all the way over to Slaver's Bay. And uh, if you blow this horn, then uh, you will get the dragons. Uh, and also please go and get Daenerys and bring her back for me. That's what he goes off. And Tarion thinks to himself, you know what? I'm I'm clever, me. Uh, I'm not going to blow this hell horn. Uh, I'm going to get people to do it for me. He has Makoro come in, 
Makoro is a red priest who just appears um, after a shipwreck and then just gets rescued uh, and appears to be on Victorian side very clearly isn't on Victorian's side is actually going to be on Daenerys's side tells him what this hell horn is about and basically says yes if you if you blow this horn then you will die that's what happened to the person who blew the horn back at the king's moot but it will bind the owner of this horn uh, to the dragon so um or vice versa so uh, Victarion then goes, great, make me the owner of the horn, and then um, I will have the dragon. So that's where we left it. Victarion is now coming into Slaver's Bay. He has the horn, uh, and he's going into uh, Slaver's Bay, and he's going to get three of his um, uh, guys on the ship to blow this horn. He's promised them, yeah land and riches and all the rest of it they will almost certainly die uh, he says they're going to blow this horn uh, and he is going to claim the dragon so that is where we're at euron if we scroll all the way back euron claims to have got this horn from old valeria now obviously old valeria now is this smoking mess of a place no one goes there it's horrible it's horrific people would not believe him in the there was an app a while ago called the world of ice and fire app and in that it said that euron got the horn from the um warlocks of karth now the warlocks of karth these were the undying if you remember the piat pre and after their home had been burnt down by Daenerys they went off to hunt for Daenerys and they brought with them this barrel of shade of the evening juice this thing which allows them to see magical visions and all the rest of it and Euron captured them and he captured this barrel of shade of the evening and according to that app which is semi-canon then he also got the hell horn from them so i think uh in answer to your question eric where did the warlocks get how did they get this horn to start with i think there are two options the first of all is this is only a semi-canon thing that says they had it perhaps euron did get it from old valeria it's possible he is crazy enough to go there and in the pre-release chapter from the winds of winter we do see him in this uh, valerian steel suit of armor which can only really have come from old valeria so he must have gone there uh, so i think that's option one option two is that we trust this app uh, which was signed off by George R. R. Martin. I don't. We don't know whether he signed off every detail of it, which is why it's semi-canon rather than actual canon. Um, but if the Warlocks got it, then I can only assume it's because Karth was at one point under the aegis of the Valyrian Freehold. And when... Uh, this means that there must have been, because Carth is a very ancient city, it was around at the time, there must have been Valyrians on dragons who were there at some point, and so they must presumably have had uh, one of these horns. The horns are there to control dragons, we're told. So that seems to be the most likely possibility, that there just happens to be one in Carth left over from the the valyrian freehold times and they kept it there in the house of the undying which was more powerful in the past than it uh, it, it is in the present day of a song of ice and fire so those are the two options we have going on there um personally i'm kind of heading towards the idea that yes valyrian is uh, sorry that euron is crazy enough to go to old valyria but um and and got some stuff there so that's the um i mean that's the coolest answer to all of this i have to say um 
Uh, Jamie McKenna saying, uh, like the new lighting. Thank you very much. Is a new laptop actually, which is uh, which is perhaps slightly brighter, better, um, uh, better camera or something. So uh, thank you. I'm glad. Um, this is a good chance, though, uh, just while we're uh, warming up on this live stream, to say today I am launching. And please have a check it out. I am launching my website which is quite basic at the moment, but this is going to be the hub for all things in Deep Geek, which is indeepgeek.com. So do please go and check that out. Um, I am launching a whole range of stuff on there at the same time, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but please do go and check out indeepgeek.com if you're at all interested in that. So that's going to be now, uh, from now on, the home of all the stuff I do. Yes, I'm obviously still going to carry on doing uh, the Well Told Tell podcast. I'm still going going to be doing it in deep geek on youtube and all the rest of it but if you want uh, the hub of what i'm doing that is going to be it uh, zach lock saying regarding dragon binder it has been blown at the king's moot the slave died no dragon came why should it work better in marine uh, moreover how could the dragons be linked to someone who will not blow it victorian or euron so um it didn't call a dragon when it was blown on the um, Iron Islands. The implication is that this has to be, a dragon has to hear it, and that is what creates the magical bond or whatever it is. So because it was on the Iron Islands, there was no dragons around, so it could be blown and nothing happened. However, the the spell was cast, so to speak, and the person was sacrificed, so to speak, being the person who blew it. When um, this guy, whose name was I think Kragon, he he blew the horn, and afterwards he died. And when they investigated his body afterwards, they found inside he was all ash inside. He had literally burned from the inside out, blowing this horn. So that. It, it seems that they cast effectively cast the spell associated with this horn, but it didn't work because there were no dragons in earshot. Why would it be different in Mirene? Because there will be dragons in earshot. There will be dragons who are able to hear it. There will be two dragons there. Uh, Victorian has arrived. There are two dragons flying around above Marine at this particular moment in time. So... Um, saying how could the second part of the question is how could dragons be linked to someone who did not blow it so makoro is a very interesting character so makoro as i say he appears he was shipwrecked and then got, got rescued by victarian and then immediately comes in and advises victarian and seems to be on his side but he's not he's been sent by uh, the uh, great temple in Volantis, the, the red god, R'hllor, and he's been sent to Daenerys to support to Daenerys. So is he going to help somebody who wants to steal Daenerys's dragons? No, of course not. So we cannot trust what he says to Victarion. But um, it makes sort of sense that um, uh, what he says is that the the horn does not bind a dragon to the person who blows it because we know that whoever blows this horn will die but it does to whoever has ownership of that horn and then he says do you want me to make you the owner of that horn through some sort of magical means now um we shouldn't necessarily believe him but that bit does kind of make sense and it kind of makes sense that what Euron's plan was was that he owned the horn he'd done whatever magic it was to make himself the owner of the horn he thought Victarion would go over there blow it himself die but the dragon would be bonded to Euron and would therefore come to him that seems to be Euron's plan Victarion's plan seems to be that he will make himself bonded uh, the owner of the horn and other people will blow it, and then the dragon will become bonded to him. Makoro surely is going to try and scupper all of this. So that's what's going on on these different levels. And it kind of makes sense that the person who blows it is not actually uh, the person who 
is uh, the, the control of the new bonded person to the dragon. Uh, Common Mushroom saying, got to get a four pack of lager on me. Uh, thank you so much. That's very kind. Lockdown two is brutal. Take care. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will I will happily go and get that and maybe even drink it from my... Guys, I'm so all over the merch today on my Kraken Tacos mug, available now on IndieGeek.com. I'm so excited that I remembered all of my merch today. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Common Mushroom. I very much appreciate that. Um, uh, Totes Bracken Leben Lenger saying, how would you control a dragon without a horn? Somehow the Targaryens managed to confine Valerian to the dragon pit after his return with Aria. Um, so uh, the Targaryens, it would appear, did not have any dragon horns to control dragons with. We never read about one, but they did seem to have knowledge of them. At least Daenerys seems to, when she's right at the very end of A Dance with Dragons, she remembers that the, the ancient Valyrians used to have these dragon horns that they could control their dragons with. But the Targaryens didn't seem to have these. So for whatever reason, they must have been very rare, these dragon, these uh, these horns. Um, what seems to be the case, as best as we can understand at the moment, is that a Targaryen can bond with a dragon, uh, or anyone with Valyrian blood can bond with a dragon, and they can be linked in, in a way. But that doesn't mean that... It, you control the dragon. The dragon is an independent being. There are plenty of examples of dragons who, um, although they're technically bonded to somebody, don't do exactly what uh, the the dragon rider wants them to be doing. A classic example is uh, Princess or Queen Alisanne and Silverwing up at the wall. Uh, Silverwing will not cross the wall even though alisan wants to uh, there are many other examples if you go through fire and blood of dragons just not doing exactly what they're told the dragon binder by implication is not about that bond that you would have between a human and an, an animal dragons are not just animals but that's the sort of the idea that you've got there but it is something more it is more about control perhaps this is the where Daenerys seems to think that um, uh, the difference lies so there is still an element of Targaryens able to make dragons do what they want but they cannot always make dragons do what they want if a dragon wishes specifically to do something else so in terms of confining Valerian to the dragon pit after its return with area this is um the kind of thing that Valerian at that point was a very old very tired very injured dragon yes of course that's the point at which if uh, if you could ever control Valerian then or lead Valerian somewhere then that is the point at which you do it um so you can influence dragons but you can't ever control them without some sort of magic is the that's sort of the hints that we, we're getting um just having a quick flick through the chat um so we've got um da -da -da -da. Uh, Tati Marie saying, in Fire and Blood, it's mentioned that hell horns were sounded during the doom, that they are harbingers of death. Is there a difference between those hell horns and Dragonbinder? I do not know. So the um, I missed that reference in Fire and Blood, I have to say, as I was going through it. Um, is there a difference between those hell horns and Dragonbinder? Well, quite possibly. We do not know. So Dragonbinder is a mystery, is that all we have are two people telling us about it. Euron, who is not the most reliable of witnesses, uh, and Makoro, who, for the reasons I set up a moment ago, is also not the most reliable of witnesses. The implication is that this is just one of those drag, one of those dragon binding horns that Daenerys thinks about, because 
it seems too much of a coincidence that Daenerys would think about, oh, hang on, I can't control my dragon, but there used to be a way for Valyrians to control their dragons with magical horns, and then a magical horn appears. Uh, that just seems too much of a coincidence to be not the case. So I think that it definitely is something along those lines, but the, the details of how it works are probably uh, being muddied by Euron and Makoro. Uh, Fletcher Reed saying, I don't have a good question, so I just want to say I appreciate your content. Thank you so much. That's really, really kind. Thank you. Um, so uh, disputed lands. Hi there, Amanda. Great to see you in the chat saying, um, I don't think the 40 Dragon Lord families would have needed them. The logistics would be insane if they all had dragon stealing powers. Everyone would be stealing dragons all over. Yeah, I think that's true. So we're not, this isn't a matter of um, there being millions of these horns all over Valyria that everyone could use them all the time. They do seem to be quite um, rare particularly now but even at the time that as amanda says the logistics are seem to suggest that there weren't lots of them all over the place that you could just like toot a horn and then a dragon would suddenly appear and come and say well, what can i do for you that doesn't seem to be the way that it works it it seems to be that there are some of these that the, the most powerful families perhaps had in order to control dragons um but that's about it a uh, question from Eric Ferg saying, why does everyone only talk about Euron getting one dragon when the, horde the horn would be blown in front of two dragons? Do we think it only works on one or that the dragons will be separated? I think, well, again, we don't know the details of this, but I think the implication is that this binds a dragon. And so it's it's almost like a, a single shot thing that it binds a dragon to a person. Now, perhaps that's wrong. Perhaps it would bind two dragons to one person. Perhaps what will happen is something uh, that we can't really guess at. So maybe it gets blown twice and the two dragons suddenly go, hey, now... Euron or Victorian, whoever is my master, but then maybe Makoro comes in and breaks it in somehow. Maybe it gets blown once and then Makoro comes and saves the day. We do not know. There is something going on there that we're not 100% sure about. Um, so my guess is that it is just the one to one thing. It, get, it gets blown once for one dragon and that dragon then gets bound to somebody. But Makoro is the wild card in all of this. The person that Euron seems not to, I mean, he's probably aware of his presence, but he probably doesn't know what he's about to do or wanting. Victarion certainly doesn't know what he's wanting to do. Um, and so Makoro wanted to have the Hellhorn. He says in the pre-release chapter from the Winds of Winter, he sort of says, do you want do you want me to have that? And Victoria says, no, no, I'll keep hold of it in my cabin for the time being. So Makoro is trying to get hold of it, but he hasn't yet managed to do it. So I, my best guess is that it does get, say, blown once, and then Makoro just changes the whole game by preventing Victoria from doing it again. Henning J says, Hi, Robert. In the Winds of Winter, will we read about any Krakens rising from the deep, um, awakened by Dragonbinder? To be honest, I personally don't think so. Any indications to the contrary? So this is uh, the kind of thing that I think we often get a bit muddied with. People, there are theories out there all about the sort of the... What, what is it the Euron's going to be doing? Now, he clearly has timed the battle that's happening off the south coast of Westeros with the battle that's about to happen in Slaver's Bay. He has slowed, all the indications are that he has slowed 
the passage of ships coming uh, from uh, all the way around the east coast, uh, the, the royal fleet effectively coming round to attack, it would have made a lot more strategic sense for him to take out the two fleets that he's facing, the Red Wine Fleet and the Royal Fleet, to take out the Red Wine Fleet first, then deal with the other fleet, uh, rather than wait for them to come together. But he seems to have been sat on an island just hanging around for a while. He is just, his aim is to create a huge battle and to create a huge sea battle at the same time as what is happening in Slaver's Bay. This is in order to create the maximum amount of carnage. Euron's brain does not work like everyone else's brain works. He is not here trying to do some kind of strange tactical um, or convoluted tactical uh, set of battles against uh, the forces arrayed against him. He is simply trying to create carnage and then he wants to he wants to destroy the world and be king of the ashes god of the ashes so that is what is going on there is he going to perform magic well yes but the magic that he seems to be looking to perform is he's wanting to be binding the dragon to himself by what Victarion's doing over there. And he's wanting to make a huge sacrifice in a sea battle. That is what he is wanting to do, create this huge amount of carnage. Now, where the Krakens come in is that we've been told and reminded a few times, actually, in Fire and Blood, this is the... And, just to remind ourselves, Fire and Blood is the book that George R. R. Martin has written between A Dance with Dragons and The Winds of Winter. So he will have in his mind what little bits of foreshadowing do we need to drop into this book. One of the things that gets mentioned, a, I wouldn't say a lot, but quite a few times, three or four times specifically, is the fact that Krakens apparently appear and are attracted by the scent of blood in the water. If Euron can create a massive sea battle, he will be attracting Krakens to that sea battle. He will be raising Krakens, not through magic, but just through creating huge amounts of dead people in the water. That is what his aim is. So he will indeed be creating Krakens. He will be trying to summon a dragon, and he will be trying to get every single one of these magicians and holy people that he's strapped to the front of uh, the, all of the boats that he's got uh, to be doing whatever magic they possibly can. He is just trying to be creating this huge magical maelstrom happening off the south coast of Westeros. So is Dragonbinder going to be summoning Krakens? No, that's not what the Dragonbinder... Dragonbinder is just about the dragon. But he is going to be doing a huge amount of things, and one of the offshoots or one of the results of that will be the arrival of Krakens. That is the way that I see it, at least. So um, if people are talking about blowing the Hellhorn in order to summon dragons, that's not the iteration of events that I think we've got going on there. Um, let's... Um, have a, another question from Bride of Fire saying, Hi, Robert, what do you think th about the theory that Dragonbinder actually doesn't bind dragons, but people? Since that could then explain why the Ironborn was so enthusiastic for Euron, then started to lose faith once the Hornblower died, and they started to voice dissent. Also, given Victarion's obsession with the Horn, do you think uh, he'd be tempted to blow it himself? Um, no, I think that he believes that if you blow it, you die. So I, I think that he will not blow it himself. Now, will the, uh, does the Hellhorn, does Dragonbinder bind people? I think it probably is what we think it is, which is this thing which binds a dragon or controls a dragon gives a person control over a dragon. Um, I think what we saw happening in the Iron Islands was actually purely human. There was this incredibly magical thing that happened, which didn't 
fundamentally affect anything other than killing the person who blew that hell horn. And I think people were shocked by it. And I think people saw that Euron wasn't just all talk. He actually could bring back huge treasures. I think that they then did get behind what he was promising. He was promising magnificent things. You get the other two, Victarion and, and Asher, were basically giving sort of different versions of, well, we'll do a bit of raiding and we'll return a little bit to the old ways. And uh, it, it was all kind of half measures. Yes, they, they said them very convincingly and all the rest of it, but Euron comes and says, well, forget all that. We're just going to take all of Westeros. We're going to take everything... And, and I'm going to have dragons, and we're going to use magic, and it's going to be amazing. And basically, he was this hugely charismatic figure who just came in and blew the rest away. And that, I think, is what we saw happening at the King's Moot, where there were suddenly doubts and there's dissension, I think, is when people get past that moment where everybody gets built up into a great fervor and supporting him and they go actually Euron really he does have a few downsides um not a hundred percent sure about him that after you get this euphoria of that initial moment so I think that that is purely human what we've been seeing going on there that that is um the kind of thing that you might see um, I haven't seen any, um, I'm going to try and steer clear of politics here, but but people can be whipped up into a fervour uh, by pedagogues across the world. So um, that, I think, is what's happening. It's only when you actually take a step back and away from these things that you can stop and you can go and you can look and go, actually, you know what? Maybe that person's not got the greatest character out of everybody in the Iron Islands. Maybe we shouldn't have completely trusted him with everything. Ryan Larkin, thank you so much for the super sticker. I hugely appreciate that. Um, let's uh, have a quick flick through the chat, uh, see if there are any more questions. Um, uh, 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 Darth Whiffy saying, just wanted to say that I love your work and think you're on a par, if not better, than Alt-Shift-X. Well, that's very kind. I think uh, Alt-Shift-X is exceptional, uh, and he's a, he's a very nice guy, too. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying, I think Euron, in a very Lovecraftian way, could be overwhelmed by the dark magic he is dabbling in. Yeah, I think that's entirely possible, but I think that we'll only see that as this goes further so euron is going to unleash things that he cannot control and i think he's going to do that deliberately and i think he's going to know that he can't do that he can't control the things that he unleashes but he is going to try and surf the wave of all of this uh, and emerge uh, having destroyed as much as he can emerge being the person on top of it all um Question from do, 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 where we're at, Mara Lee saying, according to Makoro, the Valyrian glyphs on the horn read, I am Dragonbinder, no mortal man shall sound me and live, blood for fire, fire for blood. Do you think Makoro was telling the truth? I think actually on that he probably was telling the truth. If true, uh, does this mean that it will take a mortal woman to sound Dragonbinder? Do you think then that the mortal woman will be Danny herself? This is really interesting. And I think I've got another question on this related to this a little bit later. This is very much a, a play on what Tolkien did with um, Eowyn, who uh, the Witch King of Angmar had this prophecy about him that said you know, he, can't, he can't be killed by any mortal man and then a when you'll remember the moment from the films i'm sure from the movies you know i am no man and then she kills him and that worked really well there and there are many layers that i did a video on that if you're into tolkien i did a video on that um two or three weeks ago actually if you're interested in that there are many layers to that um not just the simple trick of not a man but a woman uh, but other things as well Will George R. R. Martin go down that route with this? Um, I think that the 
the glyphs of their in old valyrian we know that we shouldn't trust the gender pronouns in old valyrian so uh, if makoro talks about uh, no mortal man might that mean no mortal man or woman that's entirely possible uh, in the same way that uh, maester aemon is is sure that you know these the prince that was promised could equally be the princess that was promised so uh, should we trust makoro with the wording i think actually it kind of makes sense with what we understand so probably yes I, I think instinctively George R. R. Martin is not going to go down this route of therefore a woman can blow it because it, it means that that particular horn has to have been created in order for just a woman to be blowing it. And I think that it's given the fact that the Valyrian society was based on slavery, frankly, I think that they see this as being blood for fire fire for blood it is a sacrifice the person who blows the horn dies that's the blood and that gets you fire that gets you the dragon so the the sort of the trick seems to be in the wording that we've got there so if you make blood ice, you get a dragon that seems to be what it's saying the blood sacrifice is the person who blows the horn i don't think he's trying to play a little um gender pronoun trick on us here um henry white saying uh asking do joraman's horn which is the horn of winter and dragon minder use the same type of magic i would argue no i mean the i at some point i will do a whole theory on magical everything in a song of ice and fire but Magic seems to be just a way that the world works here. We we think of it as magic. This is just a different extra layer to how the world works. So on one level, yes, yes, it's all working in the same kind of ecosystem. But the Valyrian magic does seem to be a very based on fire and blood in a way that the, uh, the children of the forest magic, which seems to be where this is coming from isn't necessarily yes there does seem to be some degree of sacrifice there and that'll be interesting when we get to the horn of winter we'll cover that in a moment but it seems to be less direct is my personal guess the dragon binder seems to be if you want to do this now you have to sacrifice a person whereas i suspect that the horn of winter works on a slightly different basis um Ultra violence, thank you so much. Saying hi, Robert, from your last video on Danny. Do you think only someone who is magical, i.e., part dragon, can survive blowing the horn? It it's possible. It's possible, but I think that. Um, and sorry, I should say for those who haven't watched it, my last video on Danny um, was actually I think the disputed lands is in the chat. I did I reference the disputed lands in that video. Um, I would highly recommend you go to her videos all about the Valyrians and the uh, the use of blood magic and the genetic manipulation that they almost certainly got involved with. The upshot of all of that, what I took of, from all of that, was that the Targaryens are literally part dragon. So when we get dragon binder, perhaps this is just binding dragon to dragon. This is what makes it work. This is how the Valyrian bloodline works, perhaps. So that is entirely possible. But I think that the sacrifice has to be there. This idea of blood for fire, fire for blood, clearly Im implies to me at least that there has to be some um sacrifice also the no mortal man shall sound me and live seems to suggest that the way it works is someone else blows this dragon and then they um uh, they get to um uh bind a dragon to the owner of the horn now if I were to go off into tinfoil world, then I would say I think that Daenerys, once she 
gets back once all of this has blown over once we get Makoro presumably in charge of this horn Victarion um, I suspect will not be in Daenerys's good books for having come in and tried to steal her dragons Makoro will probably present her with this horn I suspect where we may end up is that Daenerys says right I need to make sure that Drogon is properly bonded to me. Uh, I And Makoro says, I can make you the owner of this horn. He does so. And then maybe she then makes Victarion blow the horn. Maybe he is that figure that we saw on the prow of a ship uh, with the ashen grey lips. This is one of the things that we learned about what happened to Cragorn, who was the guy who blew the horn originally for Euron, was that his lips got all blistered. So perhaps that is what uh, we're seeing there in that vision from the House of the Undying, that that is Victarion, who has been made to blow the horn in order to bind Danny to Drogon. It's tinfoil, but I like it because I think that Danny will want, if she's got the ability, she will want to bind Drogon to her because she will not want the same thing happening again because Drogon just flew her off somewhere and she had absolutely no control. Uh, so uh, an interesting uh, question. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mara Lee just answered that one. Uh, Sha Sha saying, as the dragon horns are supposed to be uh, a kind of taming device for dragons, do you suppose there might be a similar device for taming the others that the children of the forest may have lost or that may have been destroyed or captured by the others themselves? I think, I mean, taming is probably the wrong word, but I know what you mean. So some way, if you've, you've got this hugely powerful thing and you wish to make sure that you can control it you have this device that you can use that seems to be where the targaryens or the valyrians even went with this was that they're using dragons but they want to be able to control them because they know that fundamentally if they cannot control them then you know game over with dragons so might the children of the forest on the assumption that they created the others and i think it's a good working assumption um might they have done something similar a way to control the others i think history would suggest that they didn't because they appear not to be able to control the others i think what they did instead though was that i think yes the thought must have gone through their head is that how uh, if this goes wrong how do we stop them and i think that the way that they did that was to uh, make sure that there were some uh, things built into the others that made them vulnerable and the children knew about it. So dragon glass, the others are vulnerable to dragon glass. And that was what the children of the forest weapons were made of. The humans didn't use dragon glass weapons because dragon glass is quite brittle. It's not a great thing to have as your uh, tip of your arrows or whatever um, unless you're using it against the others so that seems to have been what they did was they kind of built in these um, self-defense mechanisms against the ways they knew to do it another one that again I will do a video on it at some point that seems to be there is this not being able to cross water business and the children of the forest they've got the Isle of Faces in the middle of water, Dragonstone, where you've got your um, dragon glass mine in them surrounded by water and so on. That does seem to be what they were about. So um, I don't think they had the equivalent of a magical, ha magical horn to control them, but they did think about it and they did put in some safeguards. Mara Lee, thank you so much for the, uh, the super sticker. I very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Question from uh, Diego Godoy saying, what happened to all the horns that the Valyrians used to have to control their dragons? Were they all destroyed in the doom or did the Targaryens take any of these horns with them when they moved to Westeros? 
Thanks. So uh, we again, we don't know, but the clear implication is that the Targaryens did not have one of these horns. It certainly didn't appear any time from when we we're reading through Fire and Blood. There's no mention of these magical horns that they might have had. Um, so the Targaryens didn't seem to take any with them. So the clear implication is that they were, there weren't, as we said earlier, there weren't many of them and everything in old Valyria just blew up. And when we're just, I mean, that sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer from George R. R. Martin, but the this was massive. When we talk about the Doom of Valyria, this blew, there's, there's a, a, not just a city, but an entire archipelago. This was hundreds of miles wide, this kind of, the area of devastation we've got going on this was massive so yes we can believe that everything might have gone at the doom of valyria obviously there's there will be some things which are valyrian which survived we've got a whole load of valyrian steel swords we've already talked about uh, the potential that dragonbinder perhaps might have just been hanging around in uh, in somewhere like Carth, there were a few dragons that did survive, as well as the dragons that the Targaryens had. There were a couple of them in Lys that just got attacked by the people in Lys. Uh, and we know of at least one dragon that survived, uh, and the dragon rider went, tried to go back to Valyria to sort of reclaim it, uh, and that failed so that dragon died as well so there were some dregs of the empire some just few things just sort of left scattered around but the majority of it did just literally blow up so uh, that's um uh, what i think we have to believe about the horns is that the vast majority of them are gone this may well be the only one that is left uh, B says, hello, Robert. Love your content. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a Here's a somewhat random and tinfoily question. Is it possible that Dragonbinder affects Targaryens and not just the large winged dragons? If, as some think, the Horn of Winter awakes long dead Starks or their statues, could Dragonbinder likewise affect human Targs or perhaps stone dragons or statues of Targaryens? So I think we shouldn't see these uh, as a good question, but I, I think we shouldn't see these as two equal and opposite things necessarily. Thematically, I think they are, but in terms of what they actually do, no, I don't think. I think they're very different items. So the Waking Stone Dragons. Now, I'll get onto the Horn of Winter in a little bit and then explain some of my thinking about the Awaking Stone statues there. The issue with stone dragons is the waking dragons from stone idea that we get in the Azora High prophecies. Now, we don't ever read the parchment. We just, or wherever it is that this is actually written down, we just get um, people like Melisandre talking about this. Now, I think we're not going to fundamentally see stone dragons become come to life. There are lots of stone dragons on, for example, Dragonstone. I don't think that we're going to see uh, the Hellhorn blown and them suddenly come to life. I don't think we're going to see Daenerys suddenly find herself with this army of dragons. I don't. That's not really where we're going with this. I think we're only going to have these three dragons in this story. The bringing dragons to life from stone thing, I think, is mostly focused in on Daenerys, who has brought um, to life three dragons from stone eggs. That is, um, uh, that is where her sort of bit of the fulfilling the Azora High prophecy comes from. And I think John will similarly bring statues to life. I will talk about that in a moment. Uh, but I do not think that the dragon binder is going to be affecting the uh, stone dragons or Targaryens in that way specifically. The Horn of Winter, I think, is connected in with the Starks specifically. 
Dragonbinder, I think, is just about dragons and Valyrians more generally. It's just that we happen to only have one real branch of those high Valyrian families uh, left with us. Um, Sean Abbas saying, I think that John is the dragon from stone. King Arthur, as well as Mithras, are highly associated with, are heavily associated with stone. George R. R. Martin has said Mithras was a big inspiration for him. And Ants Robinson saying, could the stone dragon be a metaphor for the grayscale Fagon is bringing with him to Westeros? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think those are both really good um Good point, sir. Uh, Jose Mercado saying, hi, Robert. Glad I'm finally catching a stream in real time. Welcome. Uh, it's great. To, if this is your first time watching live, then uh, fantastic to have you with us. Um, it's a very different experience watching it live. I hope you get involved in the chat and enjoy all the uh, excellent comments. Oh, th this I always think with these kind of things, I came back to this subject because there were so many questions that I didn't get a chance to answer. And there are so many theories and thoughts if you're watching live uh, in the chat just to get engaged with. Uh, the Purple Lord Leo Anansi, thank you so much for the super chat saying, missed the intro, so you may have discussed, but what do the horns represent as narrative elements? Thanks for all the amazing work. Yeah, I will come on to this. I think I'll try and bring it all together at the end, but I will say this now. So the uh, the the two horns are represent representing in some way a, a way of controlling or fighting against in the the two forces of ice and fire that could destroy the world now i've said on many times george r, r. martin has talked about inspiration from fire and ice the poem by Robert Frost, he keeps on coming back to it, that this is, you know, t there are two forces that could equally destroy the earth. This is not just a, a story about how do we confront the others. This is a story about how does humanity deal with these two forces that could equally destroy the earth. And in their own ways, these two horns are intended to show possible ways of fighting against these two different forces. The Horn of Winter, as I'll come on to in a moment, is about how do we create uh, something to fight against the others. Dragonbinder is about how do we control dragons so that we stop them from doing the things that um, that they would perhaps otherwise naturally do. So that's what their role is, these two horns. They are going to be important. I didn't mention it earlier, but if you uh, if you see the thumbnail for, for this video, for this live stream, you'll see there's a picture of a horn. It's a, it's a drinking horn. But George R. R. Martin confirmed, this was a few years ago now, but he confirmed that that was the draft cover for the Winds of Winter, a horn. Now, he said... It's it's the official cover until it's not, which is typically unhelpful from him. But the fact that the unofficial official cover is of a horn seems to imply that horns are going to be important in this book, in the, this next part of this story. And so the Horn of Winter and Dragonbinder will be important here. They're not... Uh, this is... I don't know if we call this a seven act, certainly book six of seven, uh, the sixth act of seven, then this is heading towards the end as we're coming towards the finale of all of this. These two horns will come to the fore and we will see what their role is. So they are there as representatives of different ways of fighting against these twin forces that are, that, that, I won't say they're trying to, but could potentially destroy humanity. Um, Andrew K. Yes, a tale of two horns. Um, so, uh, Zukai saying, What do you think about the horn of winter will cause earthquakes? Martin uses wake the sleeping giants metaphor for earthquakes. Yeah, possibly. Um, I will get on to my thoughts on that in just a second. Um, Okay, uh, then we get, where did I get up to my questions from patrons? Um, 
Question from Shannon I. Adams. I'm curious to see if you think the blowing of Dragonbinder, or simply the possession of it, may sway Danny to ally with Victarion. The Undying do say that the second husband is one to dread. If they do sack Volantis, that would be dreadful, since the small folk and slaves are hoping for Danny to be their liberator. Thoughts? Um, I think so. The it is the second um, mount which is to dread. Now, my reading of the uh, the House of the Undying um, visions is that the, the mounts are literal mounts. The first is to bed, which is the, the silver, the white horse that she rides to uh, Carl Drogo's to sleep with Carl Drogo on her wedding night. That's the first one. Drogon being the second that she rides, and that being to dread, and then Drogon is obviously um, very closely matched with Beleriand the Black Dread. So I think that the idea of that being one to dread is very clear, and then the third being one to love. Um, so I think that that is a reference to the mounts rather than the husbands um, might. Um, Victarion having either blown it or controlling it, owning it, make Danny ally with him. I think quite the opposite, actually. I think that if, from her perspective, she is going to come back from Vaistothrak, having re engaged with her Targaryen side in, in some way, uh, probably with Drogon. And she will be newly setting her sights on launching her invasion of Westeros. That seems to be where this story is going. When she gets back to Meereen, if she finds that someone has been trying to steal her dragons, we know what her response is to people trying to steal her dragons. It is not going to be pretty for Victarion. If he even once tries to blow it or have somebody else blow it uh, and or do anything other than try and give this to her, this magical item to her, then she will interpret this as him trying to take her dragons away from her and it will not end well for her for him. So that is my take on it. I don't think that they're going to ally together. I think that she is going to kill him in one way or another, uh, take his fleet and use that as uh, the basis of her invasion. Um, and building on this morally saying, uh, right now Vic, Tarion has a dragon binder. What do you think since Danny and Dragon are currently with the Dothraki? Could Victarion use the horn to try and bind the other two of Danny's dragons that are still in Marine? Yes. So to pull all of this together, I think that yes, he will probably try to blow the horn or have one of his sailors blow the horn in order to bind a dragon. I think that he may well succeed with one but then that is actually tied into Euron, and Euron may well get it. But Makoro is not going to allow him to steal the dragons. Makoro is going to intervene at some point, and I think then he is going to get captured. Danny will come back. She will be livid at the fact that he has tried, perhaps even succeeded, in taking one of her dragons, and he will uh, die. He will be killed. But Danny will get control of Dragonbinder. That seems to me to be the most likely iteration of events. And I think we have to say if Dragonbinder is important in this, and I think we all accept Dragonbinder is going to be important in this, then that means that something has to happen. Now, the safest and simplest thing is simply that Danny gets hold of it and she uses it to bind Drogon to herself so she can control Drogon, and that will allow her to be riding Drogon over to Westeros. That is entirely possible. In fact, I think highly likely. The question is whether something else might happen and whether it, the blowing of that horn might take one of the dragons away from her. Now, our... Uh, I've got a question later on about whether the um, the recent book only uh, sorry fire cannot kill a dragon uh, by Dan Hibbard, which is 
very interesting. It's sort of a background to uh, interviews to what happened in Game of Thrones with George R. R. Martin, a lot of the actors, the showrunners, lots of different people. Um, I drew, I did a video drawing out some conclusions from that. And I've got a question coming up about whether that's changed my mind about the Horn of Winter and what role that will play. Uh, and I have got some thoughts on that. But I think that um, one of the things which is also very clear, which we knew already, but I think that this that book did highlight, is that the dragons will not go north of the wall and get and one of them will not get captured by the night king at least they won't go north of the wall that early on in the plot they might later on we don't know but it's very clear from what the showrunners have said from what george R. R. martin says there that they completely made up that episode the beyond the wall episode they did that in order to get a dragon north of the wall because they wanted a dragon to be able to be destroying the wall that's the whole idea of what they were trying to do in that episode you remember the episode when you get the uh, the magnificent seven heading north of the wall and getting caught and then danny going and rescuing them and all the rest of it uh, that is completely made up by the showrunners because they wanted to get a dragon north of the wall because they wanted to be able to bring down the wall with a dragon. The implication of that is that the others will not capture a dragon, certainly at that point in the plot. Now, do we think, therefore, that Danny is going to keep all three of her dragons? I personally do not think so. I think that she will indeed lose one to someone else. I think that she will lose it to Euron, who is going to increasingly become this extra threat from the south. So I think that this is probably the most likely point at which Euron can gain control of a dragon. So I think that that is what is going to be happening, is that we're going to see um, that... Through Victarion blowing the horn, Euron would claim a dragon, and therefore, actually, Danny's invasion is going to be with two dragons, not three. But that's extrapolating from uh, not huge amounts, but just pure chain of logic from where we're at, that the others will not get a dragon, therefore, who does get a dragon if someone does? Um, okay, I think that is me done on questions on Dragonbinder from my patrons. If you've got any more questions on uh, Dragonbinder, now is the time to drop them into the chat. I'll try and pick them up. Um, I do want to very quickly do a, my proper letting you know about my new website which is indeepgeek.com so please do go and check that out um this is uh, at the moment it's it's pretty basic but it is there this is going to be my home base online from now on yes i'm going to carry on doing youtube yes i'm going to carry on doing uh, stuff on podcasts and all the rest of it uh, but that's going to be my hub going forward that's also going to be the place if you're looking for merch like this beautiful Check it out. Crack and Tacos t-shirt or mug. Um, there's also some uh, fantastic, uh, if you are a fan of uh, the Traveler's Guide, there's some uh, Welcome Weary Traveler merchandise on there as well. If you're interested in that, go and check it out. And uh, there will be tomorrow on Friday, there will be free shipping. Uh, so if you are at all interested in that, do go and check that out uh, and make use of the free shipping at all if you are interested in that. The other thing to add on to all of that is that I am now, for those who don't know, I've got a second channel called The Well Told Tale, which is 
where I do audio narrations of classic science fiction and fantasy stories. I love science fiction and fantasy, and I just want to share science fiction and fantasy, classic science fiction and fantasy stories with people. I will always be making those free for absolutely everybody on YouTube and as a podcast. But what I'm also doing now on the website is some of these are long stories taking place over several episodes. I'm squashing them together and making them available as a single MP3, easy to listen to mp3 files uh, for download off of the website um, uh, if you are at all interested in that do go and check out indeepgeek.com i've got four up there at the moment uh, if you're going to start feeling christmassy soon i've got a christmas carol uh, if you're feeling less christmassy something like the call of cthulhu is up there i've got um uh, what else have I got? Jekyll and Hyde is up there, as well as something else I can't remember off the top of my head. If you're at all interested in that, do go and check that out. And if you are a patron of The Well Told Tale, do check your Patreon messages because uh, you will get a discount for all of the audiobooks there for download. If you're a $5 patron, you get 5% off any download. $10, 10% off. $30 patrons get 30% off everything. So um, do go and check that out for your free promo code. I think that's all I want to say, but the main message is do go and check out indeepgeek.com. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the other thing to say is patrons uh, of Indeep Geek. Thank you. I cannot do any, what I do here without your support. I hugely appreciate it. Um, if you at all want to support what I do here, um, then the best place to do that is through Patreon. There is a link down in the description. If you want to get access to the audio, I try and put up all the audio I do for Indie Geek up there on my Patreon page. Uh, if you want to get access to some things I do like, uh, the I, I recorded the pre-release chapters from The Winds of Winter. If you're interested in that, there's also um, those on Patreon. So do go and check that out. Link down in the description. Thank you. Uh, okay. I think that's it. Patrons, thank you so much. Indeedgeek.com. That is the end of the uh, plugs for certain things. Um... Uh, Carl Karsnark saying, coming soon, The Call of Cthulhu, a Christmas special on ice. Yeah, it's, it's not, not really a Christmassy uh, story, but a classic nonetheless. Um, so Lulu's saying, I think that John will end up with the horn. This is uh, Dragonbinder, I assume. He ends up with the sword, the Valyrian armor, and possibly the horn, though he may be mixing all three dragon heads in his dreams like Danny, any thoughts? Yeah, so he has a dream when he's stood atop the wall. I did a video on this ages ago, but he stood atop the wall with a fiery sword, which is obviously supposed to be Lightbringer. His armor appears to be Valyrian steel, um, and um, there are no dragons there, but uh, clearly uh, he is being set up to appear, appear like um, uh, Zora High Reborn. Personally, I think, as I say, check out my video for the, the working through of that. I think that was a planted image by Blood Raven, who is wanting him to think of himself as being that. Um, so I think that's what's going on. Um, just out seeing if there's any. Uh, Sophie saying, do you think Death of Dragons might have uh, some more info on Dragonbinder? What kind of information do you think we will get and how will it wrap up the story? Um, so the Death of Dragons is this mythical book that is probably somewhere down in Old Town that Jack and Hagar is probably looking for, that Sam may find, uh, that Tyrion has heard of. And it's about we assume how to kill dragons. So uh, will we get any information from there? I don't think we're going to get you know, huge extracts from it. I think that this is just going to be about how do you kill dragons, not how do you bind them or control them. So I think that is what we're going to be uh, getting. That's what that is about. I think that dragon binder is going to be a separate issue. This is about who has control of the dragons, uh, not how do they die. 
Um, I think that is it on all of the questions about Dragon Binder. So let's go on to talk about the Horn of Winter. So, uh, as before, let's do a quick recap so we're all on the same page. The Horn of Winter, or the Horn of Joraman, who was uh, one of the kings beyond the wall, is a legend. It's, this is um, something that comes from a time when the, thir the Night's King, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, went rogue. He started sacrificing children. Um, apparently working with the others um, and eventually the King of the North Lord of the Winterfell, Stark uh, who was a guy called Brandon became known as Brandon the ba Breaker uh, he joined forces with Joraman, the King Beyond the Wall and they defeated the Night's King and we hear that Joraman blew the Horn of Winter uh, Joraman's horn and it woke uh, the giants from the earth. Now that's about all we get of from that. Then this legend sort of appears that we're not entirely sure where it comes from. That it brings the wall crashing down, and Mance Raider appears to have then gone hunting for the Horn of Winter, thinking it might be buried in some king's grave or something north of the wall. Goes searching all over the place for it, doesn't find it. Um, presumably coming thinking that he might come and threaten to blow down blow the horn and the wall comes crashing down and that will allow that means that the night's watch will allow him through now they don't find it they find a very fancy looking horn that is not it and they kind of try and pretend that it is but the game's up um while all that's going on when they did the great ranging north of the wall, the, the Night's Watch, you get Ghost, who takes and takes John away from the near the Fist of the First Men and then buried in a recent burial is this um in a what appears to be a Night's Watch cloak, a cache of dragon glass and an ancient horn. And we the, the horn appears to be, it is very old, we're told. And John tries to, he clears all the mud and rubbish out of it and he tries to blow it, but it just doesn't work. It is, in the words, broken. Now, he then gives this to Sam's, thinking Sam likes old things. Sam has it, keeps hold of it. He takes it with him when he heads down to Old Town. He somehow manages to keep hold of it because it doesn't look particularly valuable when he's selling all of his stuff in order to get um, travel all the way from Bravos down to Old Town. He basically keeps the clothes he's wearing and this horn. We're reminded of the fact that he's got it two or three times on this journey, so it's clearly important. He arrives down in Old Town and still presumably has it. That's where this story ends. Now, my um, uh, my theory is that that is the horn of winter, and it's the horn is broken that's the word where you we're given for what is wrong with this horn but that to my mind ties in very closely with the the name of one of the people who was a closely associated it with it the only time in history we know where it was and that is brandon the breaker brandon the breaker must have broken something in order to get his moniker maybe he broke a trust maybe he broke something else we don't know none of that's told to us but we do know that we have a broken horn that i think is the horn of winter so that is where we're at uh, that is what is uh, known about it um and that is where i think it is now lawn duck 20 says in fact lawn duck 20 sorry i think you sent me a message on patreon saying i missed one of your questions the other week uh, apologies i try my very best to get all of my patrons questions sometimes i do miss them either because they come in a little bit later close to when i um i go live i sometimes miss them if i'm getting myself set up and sometimes 
I'm just human and I miss them when I'm scrolling through. So apologies if I did miss uh, one of your questions before, uh, but very happy to answer this one now, saying, does Sam have the horn and not even realise it? If he doesn't have it, when do you think we'll see it and who will find it? So I think he does have the horn. I think he doesn't realise what it is that he has. At some point, he will realise it. Now, I think the key thing here is, and I think he will carry on carrying it around with him because he likes it. It is a connection between him and the wall uh, and also a connection between him and John because John gave it to him. And so I think he will keep it with him. The question is, when will he figure out what it is? Um, now, maybe he will get some information down in Old Town. Maybe it'll be something that happens when he's back up at Winterfell. But um, yes, he has it, but he does not know the significance of it yet. The Eric Fogg saying, have your thoughts evolved on the Horn of Winter in the light of fire cannot kill a dragon? Yeah, I, I referenced this um, a little bit earlier. So we've got fire cannot kill a dragon. Now, the what I try not to do is base theories or anything on what happened in the show other than as a broad guide to where the story may be heading but what i think is interesting is when the show one is very clear on things that they made up themselves because that very clearly shows that this is not something that george r, r. martin has told them in fact george r. r martin probably told them something very different and they went their own way on it and they were very clear in this book that they um they had to come up with a way for the wall to fall now they said uh, that the, the way that they were saying it, and i wish i could quote it to you but it was basically they seemed very pleased with themselves for having realized that the dragons were there. And although at the that time in the plot when they were having these discussions, the dragons weren't that big and powerful, they would soon be big and powerful. Therefore, they had to think of a way to get a dragon north of the wall, get captured by the others, by the White Walkers, so that they could then use it to bring down the wall. Now, that's interesting from the element of Dragon Binder, as we were talking about earlier, but it's also interesting from the aspect of this means that they they did not have a way to bring down the wall. In the books, if the others cross the wall, as they surely must, if they bring down the wall or part of the wall, it is with something that the showrunners did not make a thing of. They did not want to suddenly introduce, they say this as well, they did not want to suddenly introduce to the plot something hugely powerful, which means that it was something, whatever it is that does bring down the wall, they did not really mention or draw attention to in the show uh, in any way. Now, that then leaves us scratching our heads a little bit, because if the dragons do not bring down the wall, what does? The only thing we've even got a legend about that can bring down the wall is the Horn of Winter. So have my thoughts been changed on this? Well, I mean, it's possible now. I, I have other thoughts on what the Horn of Winter will do. I will talk about them in just a moment. But something has to allow the others through maybe this is the sort of the a link with bran in some way maybe they have got some other thing but if george r. r martin has introduced this concept of a magical horn that can bring down the wall then we have to accept the possibility that that is exactly what it does do so that's the extent to which my thoughts have changed is that we have, I think, pretty much absolute clarity that dragons will not bring down the wall. Something else will bring down the wall. Uh, Cam Cam, thank you so much, saying, hi, Robert, great topic. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, it's uh, fantastic to have you. Um, question from Zakalok saying, bonjour, Robert. Uh, sun is shining in confined France. Well, I'm glad the sun is, sun is shining there. Um, and I think that your case numbers are starting to come down, France. So uh, hopefully that won't last for too long. Um, regarding the Horn of Winter, 
Why do you think Brandon the Breaker broke the horn if he did? Yeah, so this is I sort of covered this actually in my intro, <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, but uh, the the horn we have is broken, and George R. R. Martin specifically used that word broken. Now, it's an odd word to use for a horn because when it doesn't look broken. There's a crack down one side, but that shouldn't try as they might. You know, they, they did everything. They couldn't make a sound out of it at all, which to me implies it is magically broken in some way. And this actually makes sense because if you had a magical horn that could either bring down the wall or raise giants from the earth in some huge earth-shattering literal way to oppose the others you would not want that to be just lightly used you would not want it just to be the kind of thing that you could just be lying around and somebody might just go ha i'll do that uh that is something that you would want to have safeguarded in some way so it kind of makes sense that if you had this thing, if you felt that the others had been vanquished for some time, you might uh, break the thing that is there to aid against them and leave instructions somehow for how it could be broke, for, could be rebuilt. Now, my my thinking is along two lines, two possibilities. The possibility one is it's a magical breaking, then you just need to learn some kind of magical thing to bring it back. And maybe that's something Sam can learn while he's down in the Citadel. Or maybe this was literally, and this is, again, it kind of it makes sense rather than there being any particular logic for it, although there is some logic I will come to in a moment, that it might have been broken in two. And half of it be north of the wall, half of it be south of the wall, because this was used when both sides, both the wildlings and uh, the Starks, came together to oppose the others. And it would make sense that that is what you do, as you say. This can only be used if both sides agree that it should be used and it be brought together. Now, what when I say there is some evidence of that, there. Mance Raider was looking for it north of the wall, which seems to imply that they thought it might be buried somewhere north of the wall. He is now, however, south of the wall and will very soon, I'm pretty sure, be in the Winterfell crypts. I think that he is going to be there for a reason. He's not just there randomly you know, hanging out without any more plot happening. He, I think, is going to be there. And the fact that it was him who was looking for the Horn of Winter implies that he knows what he's looking for. And he may well find it. There is a part of the crypts, if you remember, that is collapsed. If he's going to be down there probably for days, weeks, months, he will want to hide somewhere. He wants to find somewhere within the crypts to hide away from uh, everything and maybe he will explore behind that area that uh, is sort of uh, cut off. Maybe he will find that the Horn of Winter was broken in two. Half of it was north of the wall. That was the bit that uh, Blood Raven had that he got for Sam to uh, to got ghost to give to John uh, and Sam now has and half of it was uh, buried down in the Winterfell crypts that as I say it's half tin tinfoil but half it, it makes sense so that would be those are the two options either it's magically broken or it was literally broken in which case we need to find the other part to it and where is the most logical place for the other part it's for, it's in the crypts of Winterfell um <laughs> uh, horizontal saying they should drop the horn in some warm coal to reveal the explanatory text written on it yeah I, you jest uh, as a Lord of the Rings reference but the, the, the dragon binder has, has text on the side which explains it so maybe the horn of winter does as well it's just that they don't even think to do something like that so uh, that's entirely possible and we are still I think I think waiting for the I am an inevitable big Lord of the Rings nod. Now, 
George R. R. Martin has put nods into all sorts of uh, writers that he admires throughout his story. And we get some things that are vaguely Lord of the Ringsy. So we get Sam as a character, um, Sam Well, like Sam Wise, but there's nothing which is obviously his nod. And he loves Lord of the Rings. If you see any interview with him, you can't stop talking about it. There has to somewhere be a big Lord of the Rings reference. And I think, I mean, maybe it's that. Um, uh, we'll wait and see, I guess. Uh, Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert, could you remind us why Samuel took the horn down south with him? Why not leave it at the wall? Um, I think, well, as I said, I think that this was as much as anything, this was him um, taking all of his stuff. He thought he was going down for a long time. He He headed off down south with Maester Eamon, the idea being that he was going to go and train up as a maester. And in order to become a maester, they don't really have a huge amount of idea about what sort of time constraints they've got so far with the others. They've not really got much of a thought of that. But in order to train for a maester, the fastest people go is two or maybe three of the links per year. That's how fast, you know, most people you know, don't go anywhere near that speed. So Sam, in order to make a full chain, Sam's expecting to be there for a few years. So he's taking all of his stuff. He's, yes, he will go back to the wall, but he's not expecting to be, um, uh, you know, don't leave a room for him there with all his stuff in there. He'll be back in a few weeks' time. He is heading off and taking everything down with him. So that is why he took it with him, because he was taking all of his stuff, as I said. I think also this is a, a reminder of the wall and also of John, uh, who was his best friend, of course. Um, Mara Lee saying, I believe Sam Tarly has the Horn of Winter. Yes. If so, will he find something in the library at the Citadel to show him how to magically heal the Horn so it can be used again? Will the information also show Sam any more uses for the Horn of Winter than what was previously known? Do you think Jon Snow will be the one to use the Horn of Winter to try and protect Winterfell during the war with the others? Adrian Birch also I see in the chat saying, who will blow the Horn of Winter? Um, Mance no longer needs it to get to the people um, um, uh, to get his people south okay so will Sam learn anything new there as I say it's possible that he might but when he goes back up when it needs to be blown when they've got it unbroken in whatever way this is and they've decided that they need to blow the Horn of Winter. Who is it who's going to blow it? Well, I think the way my mind works is the, you have to say who is symbolically the right person to be blowing this. Now, maybe it should be the Lord of Winterfell, because this is uh, the Starks are clearly um the last line of defense here against the others maybe it is them who should be doing it the king of winter or whatever maybe it's their role it's clearly connected in with the starks in some way maybe you think that this should be the the king of the wildlings the the whoever is the king beyond the wall because joraman blew it last time maybe you might think that maybe you think it's actually the lord commander of the night's watch's role to be doing that because the lord commander of the night's watch is um the person who is leading the defense against the others um maybe maybe even you think that this is the role of the the monarch the king of the seven kingdoms um because they're in charge of everything south of the wall now my contention is that you could argue John could tick all of those boxes. He probably by that point will be made Lord of Winterfell. He probably, he certainly was the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but um, you could argue that he is, he, by that point, he will still be the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Uh, in terms of the leader of the Wildlings, they certainly were following him. When they thought Mance Raider was dead, they were following him and doing what he said. And this is the way the Wildlings 
work is if you follow someone, they are your leader. Um, and obviously he could, depending on your interpretation of things, he could be the rightful king of the seven kingdoms as well. So whichever way you come at this from, the most appropriate person to be blowing the horn of winter, I think, is Jon Snow. So that is who I think is going to be uh, doing this. Um, uh, I mean, there are other contenders, I guess, but he is, by in my mind, by a long way, the most likely person. Ariel Winchester, thank you so much for the super sticker. I very much uh, appreciate that. Um, uh, question from, sorry, I did see one just a moment ago. So uh, Celeste Bouchard, if the Horn of Winter, by, uh, sorry, if the Horn of Dragon Binding scorched the lungs of the blower, would the Horn of Winter freeze the lungs of whoever blows it? So maybe they need ice resistance. Yep, that's uh, a really interesting point. I don't think that the two are equal and opposite. I don't think they certainly weren't made at the same time. They certainly weren't made by the same people, so I don't think they have the same magical properties. So I don't think we should necessarily see that. Um, but with John... I mean, I think anything's possible because by this point he will already have died. So could you kill him again with it? Yeah, why not? And you could bring him back. Uh, we know that that's entirely possible. He, he, If he dies, he could just go off into ghost again and they can just go through the whole thing one more time. Uh, Sylvester Snow saying, Hala Robert, uh, will the Horn of Winter be repaired? Who will repair it? Will it even need to be repaired in order for it to work? Um, so, yes, I think it needs to be repaired because we've been told that it is broken. We've been told that it can't be, um, it can't be, no, no sound can be t made from it. So I think it does need to be repaired. I, I think that, as I said, there are two ways to do it. Either this is magical and needs to be repaired in some kind of magic way in which that's when this um the idea of perhaps howland reed comes in um someone i can't remember whether this was uh, one of the questions i got here but certainly last time um i remember the idea that you need a reed in order to blow this horn that made a huge amount of sense so maybe and this is something what i thought i've had since then maybe howland's role is not to be blowing the horn of winter but to be repairing it if, if we need some magic to do that. Um, or maybe it is a matter of just putting together the two parts, as I say. that If I had to guess, that's the, that's the way that I think at the moment seems the most likely. Uh, Lee Roberts. Hi, Robert. Hope all is well with you. It is. Thank you. In legend, Joraman is said to blow the Horn of Winter to wake the giants from the earth in the time of the Night's King. But in present day Westeros, the free folk believe the horn can be used as a weapon to bring the wall down. I'd like your opinion on the different stories concerning the horn and its true purpose. Personally, I don't believe the horn will be used to bring the wall down, but will be used as a weapon against the others. Though I'm not sure how. Thanks for all the great content. Well, you're very welcome. Okay, so this, um, this is the opportunity I shall use to set out my theory of what it actually does. I don't think, although I've, as I said a little bit earlier, I've slightly moved my thinking to say well, maybe it's possible that it will bring the wall down, but I don't think that is the primary purpose. The primary purpose, I think, is to raise the Stark dead to fight against the others. Now, I think that this is something that we have to accept there is that there is a reason uh a, a, an internal story reason that has to be revealed for why we have the crypts why we have the stark dead there um george R. R. martin makes huge amounts of uh, focus go in on the crypts every single time we're always our attention is brought down to the crypts um the and not as just a here's where lots of people are lying dead but as a living, breathing thing, and the Stark dead are felt to be living and there in some way. You get. I was rereading or re-listening to 
uh, the first Eddard chapter in a Game of Thrones book one, when he and Robert Baratheon go down to the crypts, the amount of times that the statues get anthropomorphized is astonishing. They uh, they watch, they listen, they judge. Uh, Robert Baratheon um, uh, strokes Lyanna's cheek as as if willing her to come back to life. The amount of times I think it's like eight nine times just in half a chapter you get language of the statues being lifelike and that is not our, or being coming back to life that is not just an oddity every single time we get this theon goes down there he feels as if the eyes are watching him he feels as if the dead starks are watching him john in his dreams uh, goes down there several times and the stark dead are talking to him they're saying stuff they are they are there the legends are there that the Starks, the spirits of the Starks, are trapped down in the crypts. George R. R. Martin has focused our attention so much in on the idea that the Starks are being held. They, When the Starks die, they get put down in the crypts and they're held there. And surely, surely this is him setting us up for the fact that at some point the Starks are going to be released. And something has to be the trigger for them being released. And who is going to release the Kings of Winter but the Horn of Winter? Um, now, this is to to raise the sleepers. Uh, that is that is there. Also, we hear about the, um, the Horn of Winter, the legends go when it, it, it um, raised the giants from the earth. Now, the Starks would be coming up from the earth if we raised the Starks with the Horn of Winter being blown. Are they giants? Well, metaphorically, we might say they're giants, but also we get the statues. And the statues are fascinating because, and do check out a video I did on this as well if you want the more, more detail on it, but the statues, it's not just that we get George R. R. Martin describing like the it feeling like it's haunted and spirits moving around. It's the statues themselves. That are there and they're being said as if the, the the Starks are there watching, judging, as if they are the old Stark spirits are being held in the statues. And the statues, fascinatingly enough, seem to be giants. Now, when we're, we're never told this in specific terms, these are very big statues or anything, but every time we hear that they're sitting down but they're looking down whenever characters are looking at the, they, they look up at the statues. Um, a character reaches out a hand and touches a knee, which seems an odd height unless the statue is very large. Uh, so the, the implication is that these statues are giant sized. So actually what I think we are seeing here is we get the horn of winter which was broken when it is reformed and when it is blown that is going to release the stark dead in the form of their statues to come up out of the earth giants up out of the earth and this will be an army to fight against the others and the army of the dead and that i think is is the whole purpose of this starks being buried down there under winterfell the the whole idea about why is it that we keep being told that the stark uh the, the this is where the stark spirits are being held uh, and this is when they're going to be released so that's my uh, my a whole take on what's going on uh, with all of that um Sha Sha uh, saying, hi, Robert, do you think the Broken Horn of Winter is an, an analogue to Narsil? Uh, I know George R. R. Martin doesn't do perfect analogues, but this one seems awfully close to me. Um, so Narsil uh, is, for those who need to remember, this is a Lord of the Rings reference. This is the sword that was broken, um, Aragorn's sword, the great ancient sword of kings, uh, and it is broken and it is reforged, and he then wields it, and this is almost him um, claiming his birthright to be the king of the reunited kingdoms. So um, is the Horn of Winter 
being broken and analog to that. Well, in a way, perhaps, yes. Uh, I don't think that it's exact, as you say, it's Joaquin Martin doesn't do exact analogs. Um, it is not the same thing, and it is not a recognized um, symbol of kingship and identity in the way that Narsil was. That was very clearly there. However, I think that the idea that it will be it was broken and then it will be reforged or remade is very much what is going on here. George R. R. Martin does seem to love this idea of things being broken and then being remade. So um, I think yes, that is a strong theme that we've got going on. And I think that the Horn of Winter is a part of that. Cam Cam, thank you very much for the super chat saying uh, great topic. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, and I had uh, actually, I said that one already. I'm just going back over old ones now, but I did get another question from if I can find it. Uh, Welsh Giruso saying, Hi, Robert. Traveler's Guide series made me wonder how will the others get past the wall via either horn over gorges or bridges, perhaps the caves being let through secret passage. Will the wall fall? Yeah, I think this is this is the question. So it's not by dragon fire breaking down the wall, that much we know. I'm pretty sure they're not going to go around the wall uh, on the water. I think the water is a boundary to them. And I think that George R. R. Martin is similarly not going to create a new random thing uh, that we know nothing about that um, suddenly has the power to bring them south of the wall against this huge barrier that's been there thousands of years is not going to snap his fingers and then suddenly they're able to go past it. So that means that there must be something which either is going to get planted relatively early in the winds of winter or we already know about. So the options are the Horn of Winter, as we've already spoken, there are legends that it brings down the wall, or there are caves that go underneath the wall, or there is... Um, something like um, the Black Gate. Maybe there is some way that they can get through there. If there is, uh, I mean, on the show, they created this idea of this link between Bran and the Night King, that perhaps that means that the Night King can then sort of break through magical barriers that are stopping the others. Maybe there's going to be that kind of thing introduced. Um, uh, uh, we already have the starting point of that, which is that there appears to be a magical barrier around Blood Raven's cave preventing whites or others getting into it. And if Bran does have to abandon that, then perhaps it will be something along the same lines that maybe he creates some connection that allows them to come in. Who knows? And so maybe him moving south of the wall will allow them to come through I don't know. But uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of options. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be uh, flying over the wall, going around the wall. Uh, it might be the caves, although I think that's a little bit of a cop out. It might be the the Horn of Winter. It might be um, this link with Bran or something new. We, we've got a lot of stories still to go, remember. there's It's not too late to introduce new concepts. Something new introduced early on in the Winds of Winter is also possible. Um, I had uh, John Martin. Thank you so much uh, for the Super Chat. Simply saying thanks for all you do. Thank, thank you very much. I very much appreciate that. Um, Adrian Birchall saying, if the others helped build the wall to stop dragons going north, maybe they have a gateway to go south. Yeah, this is a this is a theory that I've heard a few times that perhaps the wall is actually blocking things going the other way, not um, not to stop the others coming south, but to stop humans or dragons from going north. I mean, I like the thinking behind this. I, I and it seemed to be perhaps backed up by the idea that Silvering wouldn't pass north of the wall. Um, but um, I think that sort of goes against the overall narrative that we seem to be constructing, which is that uh, the others were pushed back in some way, and then humanity 
created structures that would allow them to defend against their return. The, that it makes absolute sense for humanity to create a barrier to prevent um, their return. We know, however, we know that dragons can go across water, so having something that ends at water doesn't seem to make sense from that perspective. So, uh, I, I mean, I like the thinking, but I don't think it is that, to be honest. Um, Let's go to, I think that's the question is finished on um, the Horn of Winter. Oh, Rosie's just saying, do you think the Horn brings down the wall physically or destroys the magical barrier and the others will be able to go through a passage? I think I think that's possible. Um, now, uh, it's, what we have to remember is that the wall... It's not the physical wall that seems to be the barrier. It is the magic within the wall that, that is the barrier. So if the Horn of Winter does bring down the wall, then it might not be literally just bringing down the wall. It might just be that the, um, uh, that the magical barrier is somehow broken in a way. Now, that's uh, it would be very hard to show that, um, in a book, but if anyone can do that, I think George R. R. Martin can do that. So let's go. I've got a few questions sort of connecting the two uh, horns. So let's get on with them. Saying, uh, Catherine Firsith first, saying, I'm curious as to the background and historical importance of horns in A Song of Ice and Fire generally. The Horn of Winter is a myth. In, in as, uh, as it is an object in an old story from long ago and no one knows exactly what it did then or can do now. Dragonbinder is a more contemporary horn, which was used fairly recently, historically speaking, thus not a myth, since people seem to at least know what it's supposed to do. What is your personal most recent theory of how each of these two horns will affect the story and how will they be used for and by whom? So I'll use this as sort of an opportunity to wrap up my current best understanding and, and I'll just start off by what I've said a few times before about what this isn't my theory. And I know that people often use the word theory as a sort of a, an overarching way of describing when people are talking about a song of ice and fire and what might happen. This is um, I, what I like to think of as my working hypothesis. This is my best idea about based on everything we've got, all the information we've got at the moment, this is my best idea if we get more information then i will happily change it this isn't something that i'm um i'm putting out there as a theory and saying if this doesn't happen then that's terrible this is this is me trying to pull together all the information that we all have got and trying to work out what this might mean so uh, in terms of dragon binder i think that its role in the story is going to be twofold i think it's First part of its role is going to be uh, it will indeed help Danny control um, Drogon. I think that that is absolutely important for the story going forward, that Danny can actually control the dragon that she is riding. The second role that it will have is I think that it will bind um, or get one of the dragons over to Euron. I'm slightly less certain on this, but I think that it is likely. Euron clearly wants a dragon. I think that it is unlikely that Danny is going to have all three dragons for the entirety of this story, and this seems to be the most likely time for it to happen. So I think that Victarion will blow the horn, well, not him personally, he will have someone blow the horn. Makaro will not be able to stop it in time one of the two um, uh, dragons will uh, go off, uh, probably not Rhaegal, I think John will get to ride Rhaegal, uh, but I think that uh, when we get um, the uh, the uh, the third dragon that the Night King was riding in on the show, that I think will in fact diff be ridden by Euron in the books. So that is, I think, that um, if I sorry, I'm sorry, I should say um, that I think is where we're going to see uh, Dragonbinder, Horn of Winter. It will definitely, I think, be 
mended in some way, unbroken, and I think that it will be used to be raising the Stark Dead. I think it is likely it's not just the spirits of the Stark Dead. I think the spirits of the Stark Dead will probably not be particularly effective against the army of the dead, but perhaps the stone statues. And John, I would mentioned this before, and I said I would come back to it, John raising... Um, statues to life is also perhaps a sort of a hint of him uh, meeting some of this Azora High symbolism that we talk about um, uh, as uh, so much in connection with Danny with bringing dragons to life from uh, from stone. I think that that will be the main thing. It's possible that it may also play a role in bringing down or breaking the magic of the wall. Uh, so that that is what I think those two uh, horns will be. That means that they are fundamentally important in both helping and hindering the cause of humanity in uh, trying to protect itself against these two existential threats uh, to its existence being fire and ice as exemplified by the others and by the dragons so that's where i uh that's why i uh, where i am on those two horns um uh, joseph Sul sullivan thank you so much saying most elements in the story have historical analogs e.g valyrian wep weapons equal equal damascus steel what do you think of anything the horn of winter and the dragon horn represent in history um and well, this is the kind of thing I will happily throw to the chat if because uh, there are always people who've got the better uh, ideas than me on this. I don't think they're specifically historical um, horns. I think that George R. R. Martin it likes this idea of horns that are in lots of different bits of literature. Horns are used a lot in Greek mythology. Obviously, you get um, the Horn of Gondor, um, you get. Um, Boromir uses a horn uh, very effectively in the Lord of the Rings, and that is it's not a magical horn, but it is also at the end broken, which is the kind of very symbolic. Uh, so we get this, um, I think he is just picking up bits of inspiration from elsewhere rather than actually taking historical analogues. But if if there are historical analogues uh, for either of these, then I would be delighted. And if people drop them in a the chat, I will try and um, uh, pick uh, these up as we uh, in the chat when I can see them. Um, oh, the Horn of Jericho. Yes, of course. Good. That was to uh, Todd Kirsch. So the Horn of Jericho, for those who don't know, uh, it wasn't not specifically a horn, but the people, uh, the Israelite people, when... Uh, going into Israel, uh, taking Judah way back in, I don't know, historical scholars will, I'm sure, biblical scholars will be able to tell you perhaps Exodus, uh, or maybe it's a little bit later on. Uh, anyway, they've left Egypt and they go into the promised land and there's this city called Jericho and they say, how are we going to capture this? And God tells them to walk around the city seven times uh, and then blow their horns. And then on the final day, they blow their horns uh, and then the walls come crumbling down. That as a, as a biblical analog to what the Horn of Winter legend is, is actually quite a strong one. Uh, yeah. So, um, that's there. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, just seeing if there's any other possible things in the chat, uh, I will... Uh, Shauna Bass saying, don't angels also blow horns to signal rather horrifying events? Yeah, so there's lots of possible, um, uh, possible use, uh, sort of... It not historical so much as uh, biblical references going on here. Um, Julia Erickson saying, first of all, I wanted to say I love your theory about the Horn of Winter waking the dead Starks. Makes a lot of sense to me. Now onto the question. The horns have always bothered me a little bit because I want there to be a symmetry between the two of them. They are, after all, the only two horns that we know of. There are another couple of horns I'll talk about in a moment. However, apart from them being related to the two opposite forces, ice and fire, I can't find anything else that connects them. So I wanted to ask if you saw any coherence or symmetry between them. Um, I think the short answer is I, I, I think that that's enough. 
I think I I genuinely do. I think that um, these are not supposed to be equal and opposite. Um, but I think that they are supposed to be associated with the two elements of ice and fire. And I think that um, they are the use of them is for in both times they people might be thinking that they're using them to protect humanity or at least to control in some way uh, the force they they're slightly double-edged so i think that that is where where we've got in terms of these sort of uh opposites there but i think that the fact that they are both um there and they will both be used um uh by humans in order to confront or control what they otherwise would not be able to confront or control. I think that is where the, uh, the, the, the link across comes here. I don't think that there's more of a, that they're the same kind of idea about it. That's that they are supposed to be different. Um, Ariel Winchester saying, hey, Robert, just wanted to know your thoughts on the horns being the keys to stopping these threats. The Horn of Winter to play a key role in destroying the threat of ice and Dragonbinder being a key to destroying the threat of fire. Um, the, uh, so I think probably you've got this from, uh, from what I've been saying. I don't think, I think that they will play an important role, but I do not think that they're the answer in either respect, the ultimate answer. So the point I think of the others is about undoing the magic that created the others rather than just sort of opposing them. And I think that that is where the end point we're going to get with them. Uh, with the dragons, I think the dragons will to a degree destroy each other, but then I think that probably Drogon will do something like we saw at the end of um, the show. I think we'll probably fly off, leaving still the prospect that maybe not everything is uh, is perfect. I don't think it's George R. R. Martin's way to leave a very happy ending. All threats have gone. I think that he will like the idea that maybe there is still something left there that might come back one day. Um, I think that is where it is. So I, I think that they will offer hope, but they will not be the final answer. Dan Hibbard's saying, do you think there's a possibility that Dragonbinder and the Horn of Winter are actually the same thing? Could blowing them bring about an apocalyptic song of ice and fire? I don't personally, I love the idea. I, I've not heard the idea that it might be exactly the same. I don't think they are. I think they are what they appear to be. One, a Valyrian construct. The other one, a construct uh, that was very much associated with the long night. So they are separate things that have separate, separate purposes. Um, will blowing them um, bring about... Um, this sort of song of ice and fire. Well, I think that they will definitely have particular roles to play in it, but I don't think, and they might herald things. And and we do have to come back to this idea, which was introduced quite early on about this, um, the watches on the wall, the night's watch blow three times and that will signify the others. So, um, it's it's noticeable that George R. R. Martin did echo that actually in Fire and Blood when Valerian the Black Dread came back with uh, Princess Aria and the horn blew, was blown three times um, as uh, Valerian came. Uh, and that, I think, was him trying to show an equivalence between the others arriving and the dragons arriving, because it's the, you blow the horn three times to show that the others are there, you blow the horn three times to show that a dragon is there. I think that's what uh, is going on there. Seth Frost, um, uh, saying, hello, Robert, are there any rumours in the books of other possible horns with magical abilities? I do not expect to see more in the main story, but we have so many rumoured magical and mythical artefacts in our own world that it feels like George would have scattered a few more throughout the history he has written. Yeah, there is one which I've been, I think I saw someone in the chat and name check it as well. Thank you. Um, uh which is a Kraken summoning horn held by House, House Keltigar. 
on Claw Isle. Um, now, this is this is a rumor. So, House Keltigar are the uh, the third of the uh, houses on islands uh, situated there in the sort of the um, uh, the. I've forgotten my, my own geography now, but there's three islands. You get Dragonstone, you get Driftmark, and you get Claw Isle. Uh, and they're there just off the eastern coast us, of, of Westeros controlling access to King's Landing. But um, of, of the three, the least important is House Keltegar by quite a long way. But they are rumoured to have huge amounts of riches hidden away in locked away somewhere underneath the castle. And part of that is rumoured to be a, a horn which summons Kraken. And this is mentioned a couple of times. Uh, then you get Stannis, who's encouraged by a couple of people to uh, possibly attack um, Chlorile and gain all of their wealth. Um, and uh, he decides not to. Uh, but one of the bits of treasure that they're suggested that you might be able to grab is that. And hey, wouldn't it be really use useful to be able to... Um, summon some krakens to help you uh, in your sea battles. So, so that is definitely there. There's also uh, Jamie has a horn um, that he has got whose name I've forgotten, but he he takes it when he goes on his tour. Um, it's not supposedly magical in any way, but it's quite interesting that he, again, I think he plays it three times. He takes it on his sort of tour of the Riverlands when he's claiming things for the Lannisters and just trying to clear stuff up. Um, and he goes to Harren Hall and he has it blown to signify his arrival there. And then I think it's Darry and River Run um, and all of these places he claims without a battle, which is unexpected. So some people, I think, have seen that as being perhaps this is some sort of magical horn of peace or something. Um, I don't think so, but I think it's um, George R. Martin is showing that horns are, are generally used to sort of declare things and all the rest of it. Um, uh, Shah Shah saying, uh, rereading Fire and Blood. I'm going to go slightly off topic here. Um, and actually, this I've got two more questions from my patrons. So if you've got more questions, now is the time to be dropping them in the chat. And I will try and pick up as many of them as I possibly can. Uh, Shah Shah saying, uh, rereading Fire and Blood and going slightly off topic here, but while still remaining on the topic of dragons. After Balerion returned with Aria, presumably from Valyria. He had horrible scars nobody remembered and a jagged rent down his left side, almost nine feet long, still bleeding and smoking. Any idea what caused that septum bath seems at a loss. Um, so no, is that nobody knows and we're su not supposed to know when that is the point of it, is that this is supposed to be very scary. This is supposed to show us that the world is bigger and more horrific than we imagined. Valerian, the Black Dread, all through this has been built up through Fire and Blood, was built up as just um, unsurmountably impressive. The last creature alive that that knew old Valeria while it was before the Doom. Um, it, fire so uh, so hot that it could melt castles. Uh, Valerian was just astonishing. The biggest dragon anyone had ever seen, the most ferocious. And suddenly, Beleriand appears with, with a huge gash down his side, lots of scars. Something there can actually wound Beleriand and get through that, all of those scales. And that is supposed to make us go, wow that's whatever that is that was scary so that is the point of what's going on there and the sort of the connected point to that is that septum bath speculates and and it does seem to be the best solution speculates that valerian went to old valeria and that is supposed to be building up the the mythos around old valeria the fact that maybe there are things there that are uh, horrific. Now he, George R. R. Martin, I 
think this was partly deliberate in in that he wants to remind us how scary it is because he started out with all the you know you get these legends of stories you get you know people go back into old valeria armies disappear we get uh, various other characters we hear of go in there trying to find stuff they disappear don't come back so sailors are scared to go there and all the rest of it but the moment you start introducing characters like Euron who claim to have gone there, you start to go, oh, well, maybe maybe it's not that bad. And I think this is George R. R. Martin just reminding us, yes, yes, it is that bad. Uh, if Euron did go there, then, there, then that is crazy, absolutely ridiculous. So this is him actually building up characters like uh, Euron, um, by showing how ridiculous it is. In terms of the actual question of what might it have been, well, what we know for, about the Valyrians is that they were trying all of this sort of um, creating hybrid monsters, effectively. Um, they're, they're, that's one of their pet um, projects. And this seems to have been part of what created whatever it was that was eating up our uh, area from the inside. Um, they were hybrid monsters when you read the description of them, and there appear to be others. So the implication is that there are some things there in Old Valyria that perhaps don't fly off anywhere else. Perhaps they just like staying where they are but they are huge and monstrous and the kinds of things that could damage even Valerian the Black Dread. Uh, it, something that survived somehow the doom of Valeria, which, makes, which means that they have to be incredibly heat resistant. They have to be something vaguely dragonish is, is the suggestion. So I think that there is a, an earthbound worm of some kind which is there in Old Valyria, which was too much even for Valerian, and Valerian had to just fly away. Um, question, this is the last question from my patrons, saying, uh, the last escapist saying, I know this is the Magic Horn live stream, but I have to give my guess for House Dane's words. This was something we were looking at last time. We come back to it a lot, actually, House Dane, clearly ancient house, clearly important house. Um, George R. R. Martin has not revealed what their house words are, and he has basically said because they're too spoilery. Um, so uh, the late escapist, escapist says, the day will come again. Uh, you may recognize it as the last words of Hua, uh, Hua's father Tua from the uh, Silmarillion, um, and we all know George R. R. Martin loves a good Tolkien reference. I also think these would be appropriate words for the house with a sword named Dawn, which is probably actually Lightbringer, and the words would allude to House Dane's origins, which are more than likely connected to the Long Night. Just the day will come again works on many levels, so I really love that. That's a fantastic uh, idea for what their words are. I mean, I think if, if I could come up with something it, it's something along the lines of, I'm sure, something along the lines of, um, we helped out in the old, the the long night last time, and we suspect it's going to the long night is going to happen again. Until then, we're holding on to Lightbringer, and then we'll come to the rescue again, but much shorter, much cooler, and much uh, pithier. So that's the kind of thing that I think that we're looking at. You know, we we something which summarizes what their role is or what Lightbringer's role or, or what the Sword Dawn's role is, something like that. But the day will come again is, uh, is an excellent um, suggestion. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sean Abbas saying, Starfall house words are just going to be, we kill Danny. <laughs> uh, harsh. Um, okay. So, um, this uh, I'm going to have a very quick uh, check through the chat. Um, uh, Will Foran saying, Robert, what spooky place in Planetos do you want to know more about the Night Fort? I love the Night Fort. Um, uh, Andrew K saying, asking, do you think the Horn of Winter could be blown as the cliffhanger final act of the Winds of Winter? Could be an epic way to leave it off that way. Um, possibly... Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, I think that, to my mind, the the 
the winds of winter will end when Daenerys arrives at probably Dragonstone or at Westeros, and when the others reach or breach the wall. I think that is um, where we're going to, um, the, the, where the natural end point is. I suspect that the Horn of Winter actually probably won't be blown until the others have breached the wall and they're coming towards Winterfell. I think that's the point at which they, that will be blown. Um, so if I had to guess the last chapter, it would be something to do with either the wall or the dragons arriving uh, down at the south. Um, it's to do, do Brenda Star. Why would a blood raven of the children forest give John a horn that would bring down the wall that might facilitate the end of humanity? Could that mean the horn has another purpose? Um, yeah, so I think that it's so the primary purpose I think has to be bringing the Stark dead. This is this is the whole point about the the crypts of Winterfell is that the Stark dead are there waiting to be used. So I think that is the main purpose of it. Maybe it has some other unexpected side effect, um, but we'll see. And why would they um why would they do that if knowing it has that unexpected side effect? The children of the forest can uh, see right across time. Now, can they see forward in time is the question, and that's the really important, that we, we've not really seen that, but if they can cast themselves forward in time, that completely changes it, and then they're in the world of what Bran seemed to be on the show, which was manipulating events in order to get to the end point that he's already seen. If that's the case, then yes, maybe they would do something that seems counterintuitive um uh, to us in the first instance um uh carl karsnark suggesting the day will come again equals dawn um lots of uh, great question great suggestions for the uh, the words here uh fodder for foreshadowing suggesting quick thought fireworms beneath the earth lots of tunnels all over the world fireworms in westeros Dragons from stone and giants from the earth. Uh, yeah, yeah, you make it quite sound quite scary as if suddenly we're going to get fireworms appearing all over uh, all over Westeros, which would be uh, quite horrible. Um, okay, um, I think uh, with that, I'm going to uh, start to bring this one towards an end. If you are at all interested, oh, I should say, if you want to go to In Deep Geek, final plug, indeepgeek.com uh, to get fantastic merch uh or the audiobooks uh, that i've been doing me audio narrating some of the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever like the call of cthulhu alice in wonderland that was the other one i forgot about it completely um you will find the first ones up there for download as mp3 files um and uh, so do go and check out indeepgeek.com. Uh, if you enjoy these live streams, if you want to uh, listen to more, watch a few more, there's a link to the playlist appearing somewhere around here if you're watching a bit later. If you want to support this channel, uh, get access to some of the stuff I do exclusively for my patrons, there is a link appearing somewhere around here if you are watching a little bit later. Okay, everyone, take care. I will be back at the same time next week. Uh, have a fantastic week.